Well, ladies and gentlemen, Kellen Alder is in the house. <laughs> There's a lot to know. A quick little introduction, I would say. You've featured a book, 100 New York Painters. Um, you've, you've been published, your work has been published in The New Yorker, in Time Magazine, Australian uh, Geographic. Um, and you, are, you have this beautiful, boy, if I could steal this, I would. You, you refer to your art making as you being a visual essayist. Right? Mm, yeah, but that was not my... Oh, that, you know, well, that was the Yes. Oh, that's through, fair. Through the program that I went through. But you actually live it. And oh. in, in talking to in you tonight, everyone's going to understand. I mean, you really live it. <laughs> you make me think, boy, I can't get a life. <laughs> so, but let's start, let's start in the beginning, okay? okay. Um, tell us a little bit about your background. I know your dad had an interesting job. Let's go there first. Um, my, well, my father was a, a diplomat of sorts, and um, I think he had the, the wanderlust bug, because we, you know, we lived in Ecuador, Venezuela, Spain, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and he went on to Malawi, Lesotho, in Africa and Peru uh, before he finally retired. But, and he would, he, some of you may remember um, this particular presence, and he was appointed by Richard Milhouse Nixon to be Peace Corps director in Venezuela. Uh, <laughs> wow. uh, yeah. So what does that do to your creative thinking, moving around to all those places? Well, as a, as a kid, it was easy because they did all the hard work. They, yeah. you know, they did the moving. Although, you know, I, it forced me to be a little less uh, shy because every school year I had to set my, you know, in September set my tray down next to people I didn't, yeah. didn't know, or, you know, with the students. So. No, that's a, I feel like it about you. It seems like the, the big pivotal moments for you artistically um, is when you entered the School of Visual Arts, right? Mm hmm yeah. Um, so you did four years as an undergrad, and then you also did a master's there. Actually, my undergrad was kind of all over the place. I was in Arizona. I started out in Arizona because um, we were in Iran when the Shah was kicked out. And you, so you my know, our backgrounds are so similar. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't tell me. <laughs> anyway, um, so my mother, my Mexican mother, right. had grew. She came to Arizona when she was five, and so she, we had residency in Arizona. So we came to Arizona because my father didn't know where he was going to be working at the time. So, um, so I started my school at the Northern Arizona State University, and I was a real eyeball there, you know, among the... Because I hadn't even visited the United States for about seven years until I came back to... to uh, was it a lonely childhood because you had to constantly try to make new friends? Or? No. Was it too bad? No, I just, I, I regret that I haven't kept in touch with a lot of you know, he would kind of lost people on the way. Okay, so let's skip to School of Visual Arts. Boom. Okay. Now, okay. now you're there. Yeah. And um, who were the mentors there? What did they do for you <laughs> that, that changed the way you think? Marshall, Marshall Erisman was, he started this program um, at the time I was living in Utah, um, working there. And um, he started this program called Illustration and Visual Essays. Um, and that um, involved writing with with making images. Instead of just being an illustrator that's handed uh, a photograph and you're, you're just hand and you make an image, you um, you seek out your own projects, things that are important to you. And that, that really captivated me. And then they gave me a scholarship to go there, so I couldn't refuse. Right, right. So I came to, to the school of Jones. So, you know, Callum was telling me that when she would have to do, like she used to do portraits for the New Yorker magazine. Okay, so some illustrators would just take a picture or get a picture of the person that they have to illustrate, and they would do an artistic thing about it. But she would prefer to meet them, to meet the people, and to drive all over the place to find them and sit with them and get to know them. Well, I think life for me was too short not to. Uh, they didn't pay me anymore to do this, but they would send me like um, upstate to meet Joan Tower. She's a, a female composer, and, and, and I just I got more out of it than by talking to people and meeting them. And then the image was the painting was always better. So Frederick Weissman said, I think the I put we'll show them. Yeah, we'll, we'll get that to that. Grace Paley, she said. And then you know who she? She was a writer activist. Lovely, lovely woman, became a friend and supported some of the projects 
that I did later on in my so yeah. um, and a lot of them purchased the pieces or I, I gave Grace her. Okay. Yeah. Now why don't we talk while we show some visuals? Okay. I think that would be a good idea. So right. you know how to operate the um the yeah. right to remote. Okay. And um, I can just I can just we don't have to worry about the laptop. Okay. So let's start let's really we'll start right at the beginning. We're starting way at the beginning. We've got to um, hey, oh, perfect. Yeah. So, okay, I, did a <laughs> <laughs> I always have to start with a dog because I love dogs. Uh, this is <laughs> my first published piece. I was nine years old and um, I drew my schnauzer and um, submitted it to the local newspaper in Rochester, New York, and was given two dollars. And so I knew that this was a lucrative career. <laughs> so that's that's where it started, and then. Um, Actually, and then my next really real published. Piece. I was when she was ten. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> this was actually for the New York Times. When I came to New York City to go to the school of the Lights, I the first published job I got was for the New York Times Magazine, and, and of course it was about a dog. So. Can I ask you a question just before we hop to the next one? When you started doing illustration professionally. You know, you were doing it with art. You weren't using a computer to do it. It was all oh, yeah, based on no. Right, so would you say that you were part of the last heyday of the, yes. of the illustrators at yeah. that time? Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. And was it a good business to get into back then? It was, uh, you know, it was a kind of a thriving yeah. business, and a real, we were all very proud about what we did. Um, I love doing portraits, and so that's, you know, I, my my dream was to do a, a portrait of Time, you know, for Time Magazine, because all these great artists, like yeah. Paul Davis and I mentioned him the other day, yeah. did covers of Time Magazine. Oh. So. Well, let's keep going. I don't want to slow you down. So, oh, so this is the fellow we were talking about, Marshall Arisman, who's who's an artist and um, mm -hmm. the chairman of the program that I went through and um, plays saxophone with Woody Allen and. Uh, He's just a wonderful man, so I, I did his his portrait. And he owns that picture. He does, yeah. That says something. Okay. <laughs> and then, um, so for my thesis project at the School of Visual Arts, because I loved Time Magazine so much, I worked with um, the art director, Rudy Hoagland, at the time. And um, I came to Marshall and I said, um, so can I go to, my father was in Peru at the time, I said, can I go to Peru for like a month and work on my thesis project there? And, and he said, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and he gave me names of people to, uh, to meet. Um, so, so, so that was before you had the time uh, tie-in? This was now, it's my thesis, I'm working with um, Time Magazine. And so they, had, they, they felt that there was a story. Yeah. And what was the story? So the story was about um, this, the urban shift syndrome throughout, it's actually, you know, throughout the world, but in Peru it's, it's quite um, dramatic that um, Lima was a very, very elite Spanish European city for many years. In the 1960s, it was like a, a small, like a population of a million. Mm -hmm. And the, the indigenous were out in the mountains, in the rural areas, and, but they carved up the, the, the uh, land more and more. So that's why they started to come to the city. And, and uh, in the 80s, it had exploded to like six million. Right, well, but it's one all million to six million in a, in a couple of years. Kind of thing, right? Well, like 20 years okay. or so. And, but they could not, the indigenous people couldn't pay the, you know, the paperwork, the money to, to start businesses. So they just started businesses in the streets, doing whatever, selling hats, selling shoes. Yeah. But this expanded to like bringing in um, black market um, electricity, they would spin things up, you know, and, and plumbing. And, and so I met this man, he's Hernando de Soto, he's a, a world-renowned economist, and um, he was, he wrote about um, plugging into this energy of the black market and using it in the economy. And, um, and he was also, um, he introduced me to Mario Vargas Llosa, he's a writer, uh, who was running for president at the time, did not win. Oh, look at that. That's so, great. Uh, so that well, was about it. Coney Island. Um, <laughs> uh, well, that's okay. You know why? Because Coney Island is something that happened to you during SBA. Right. 
And why don't you tell us what that means? Um, well, I, I had this wonderful professor who had taught an unlocation drawing class and really took us to all places in New York, Chinatown, and he, you know, he's the quintessential New Yorker and, and very proud of his town. And so Coney Island was one of the places he took us, and I just felt at home there because the colors are so like Latin America, or you know, some of the places I grew up. And so that became, for me, you know, that I've had this ongoing relationship with Coney Island for, for many, many years. But it started with the school of Sharks. Mm -hmm. Coney Island, to this day, come to the Mermaid Parade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, this, is and this, this, this is actually a painting, though, uh, an uh, oil painting. And um, this, no, a lot of, a lot of this, what I love about Coney Island is all the hand painting there, and a lot of it doesn't exist anymore. It's been, painted, it's been cleaned up and it's smaller now, but um, mm. then, so. When I look at uh, your work on it, yeah. the, and you got to know some of the people there? My poor son has been dragged to Coney Island as a little kid. In fact, I remember him standing, in, I have another monogram of Lucas when he was about this high, standing in front of one of these arcade games. That, um, oh. Okay. Now, when, when you did this, let's see some more of these. These were wonderful. When you did these, now you, you got to know these people. Now, this right. fellow here is, yes. the, what, he has a title that I love. He's the pain-proof Puerto Rican. And, uh, <laughs> He's, uh, he, he's lovely. His actual name is Alejandro Dubois, but um, he's a sword swallower, and, you know, wraps his, lays on a bed of nails, he, he does it all. But when I met him, I was instantly in love because he was standing there and saying, I love my job, I love my job, I love my job. Wow. And uh, so that's what I, I kind of repeated that uh -huh. um, in the background. You don't really see it right away, but he was just, he was wonderful. And, uh, and you had a show out here. And he came to the show. He came to a couple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's cool. So, and he's you know does the fire eating and, and everything. Oh. And then, <laughs> now I want to ask. You see the the smile on the dog's face? Yeah. That's a strange smile. So I asked him about that the other day when we were going over our notes. Please explain that smile. So in, in Coney Island. If any of you know Coney Island, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with the um, yeah. the iconic smiling guy. Um, he, he's even on the fire trucks in Coney Island, sure. and he's the he was sort of like a carpetbagger, I think, or, you know, with red hair and the plaid suit. Right. But he's yeah, every, smile. yes, and he has that. He kind of looks like Arthur. What's his name on uh, Alfred Newman. Alfred Newman. Yeah. But. Uh, so this, this dog is a mascot in Coney Island at the Coney Island USA Museum, and um, so I had to put his little smile on. And I did, this was one of the first pieces I did for a series because um, I had to start with a dog because it loosens me up because I love dogs. Anyway. You know, in, in any of the dog pictures that you'll see tonight, you can see that she loves dogs. Because <laughs> when an artist really loves something, the painting sinks. And all of your dog paintings are beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, let's see some more. And we, that one has a hot dog in it, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thursday night you were in New York City because you were participating in a show that was all yes. about dogs, right? That's right. Uh, last, it was last night. Oh, yes. I guess. Yes. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, it was the 20th um, anniversary of the dog show. Yeah. Oh, that's 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 so, uh, yeah. It's called Mascot Studio. And uh, every year we have a show that's right at the same time, or more or less at the same time, as the dog show. And, and Kelly, you know, when we say you love dogs, the audience maybe should know that you had books that you've made about your dogs. You've had a dog that was in shows that you would put into TV shows. Or I, I, we we had a dog. Lucas helped me train this particular dog who did who played piano with her nose. Who uh, she was pet by she she was in photo shoots. Just so she was pet by Paul McCartney. And, you know, I lived vicariously through her. She was. 
just an amazing dog. Did all of you would nod your head to yes or no questions. Seriously. Some of my friends here know her, knew her. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah. Dogs are. Don't get yeah. me going on dogs. No. <laughs> Let's come back to this. <laughs> oh, look at that pain. Now this is a big pain. Okay, how big? Would you say as big it's as like, the one behind it? It's um, 16 by yeah. 40, okay. 50 or something. Isn't that something? Yes. That's a fun name for it. So that's the Mermaid Parade, which happens every summer. Um, and it's, uh, so I had the pleasure of being one of the judges, and they come up and they bribe you with alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> it's really great. It's, Raunchy and, and wonderful and very colorful. It's, is it still the same going on that you remember when you were making these pictures or has it changed? It's changed. No, it's changed. But it's kind of it had a revival now. I mean, Coney Island almost disappeared, <laughs> the, the Coney Island that we know. And I mean, Steeple Chase um, was lost in the 1960s by uh, Fred Trump. Just, you know, took down the... But anyway, okay. I'll give you yeah. All right, we're good. <laughs> All right, so no going so uh, Steve goes up. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, now, we're, now we're getting away from Coney Island and we're going to Australia. Yes. All right. We can do that. Um, so, so where in the timeline are we talking about Australia? It's sort of right after SVA? Yeah. Well, actually, it was kind of during... I was actually... Um, I, while I was doing the stuff of Time magazine, I went to a Time Christmas party. Met an Australian, <laughs> went to Australia, of course. And then I started this uh, series. I lived in Australia for five years, and I did um, a series of paintings on Aboriginal people. And he was my introduction into the Aboriginal world. Percy Trisize was his name. He was a bush pilot, and he would fly really low on his off days to try and find uh, rock art, Aboriginal rock art. And then he will so he discovered, actually discovered this cave, it's called the Magnificent Gallery. And uh, the rock art in Australia is like 60,000 years old. It's like, the, so the rock art that we see in Europe is yeah. like a drop in the bucket compared to. So he was, and he was one of the first white men to be initiated by our original tribe. Right. So he was kind of my introduction into that world. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking the way that you were raised by going from different countries to different countries, you meet some guy at a Christmas party, and now you're going to Australia. You're just, you're okay with travel, yeah. obviously. You're okay with, okay, let's go to Australia. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, so uh, when you went to Australia, you were, did you have a project that started, uh, or how'd that go? No, I just kind of, I mean, you know, I involved. But you, yeah. you could still do your New Yorker work, even though you I did, to, yeah, I did okay. my New Yorker work from, with DHL and, and fax machines. And, and they were, and New Yorker worked with you, they were okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, let's see where this takes us now. Let's see what's next. So, and then I um, um, hooked up with the Australian Geographic, and they would send me on these amazing trips out into the, um, the bush or in, you know, places that were hard to get to to be their on-location artist. And actually, there's a, um, a famous uh, botanist named Joseph Banks, who... Oh, I get close. With Captain Cook. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I know who that is. Anyway, he was... It, it was a romantic idea. I approached this one geographic. I said, you sent photographers. Why don't you send an artist out on location like Joseph Banks? Because he would document things with Captain Kirk as he went along oh, with it. And um, so, so the art director said, okay. <laughs> so they took me out like um, on trips out in boats and, they, um, and into the bush that were hard to get to. And my job was to document what, we're, what the scientists were doing. And wow, so I like this that photo because that's, that's you mm -hmm. working and I just love that. That's really And I'm beautiful. sketching a, 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 a bushman who, uh, or he would, uh, he would take cattle clear across Australia. And he's, I think he was half Aboriginal and half, half white. Yeah. Kind of interesting man. Huh. Yeah. Now, um, just one quick sudden question. When you're on location out in the field like this, do you have to be a person who camps in a tent? Or you have to be kind of comfortable with roughing it? Yes. Yes. Wow. Yeah, we camped in tents out See, there. there. That's and, lovely. Actually, the flies in, in the in Central Australia were so bad that uh, a lot of times I had to wear those hats that you 
comical with the little corks on them, just to keep the flies away from my eyes wow. and my mouth. That would go for you. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. I want to ask those questions. Okay. All right. All right. Let's see what's next. Okay. Sorry, All right. So and, um, this was um, on a boat, and uh, with, with a bunch of scientists in the, the south part of Australia, oh. we'd go to islands that were uninhabited, other than with seals and fairy penguins, and and it was with a bunch of um, scientists. So they'd bring me things up onto the boat, yeah. and the boat's rocking like this, and water spraying in, and I'm wearing this little band that's supposed to. Stop ceasing yes. from happening, and, and they bring me like plunk that that sea urchin down on my table, and and so I would start to paint it, do a little watercolor. I just brought watercolors because I didn't want to poison anybody with yeah. the toxic things, and so it would like be crawling across the table and have to move it back. <laughs> And then do it fast enough so they can put it back in the sea so it wouldn't die. But that was a sea urchin that was alive. And then they'd bring me, you know, sea lion skulls. And um, and I, I did tell you that one. Should I tell the story about that? When I'm down, so I went diving also with, okay. with them. With, because there was, on the boat, there was a woman named Val Taylor and her husband. And they... Um, that's her uh, known as she was a shark person and so they would like dump horse blood into the water and he'd go down in this cage and film and she wore this chain mail suit and she was missing part of her calf from a shark biting her from before and very interesting couple. So anyway <laughs> she uh, she loaned me a wetsuit to go diving with some of the uh, the people from Mr. Geographic and, and um, you know there's a perfectly good cage you could have gone in. But yeah. Um, so we're going down on this line and, and um, we we had to decompress uh, at 30 feet. We're going down to 90 feet and um, so I get down to 30 feet and my mask is all all fogged up and you don't want to panic but it's like and then I see this so I just have this blur and I see this gray shape like swimming toward me after they've been dumping blood in the water. That's <laughs> hard. Right. And uh, luckily it was a friend of mine. But <laughs> 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 I cleared my goggles. Anyways, that was, that was a story. She was a New Yorker. We need that picture. <laughs> All right, let's see. Let's go to something else. <coughs> we'll move this oh, look at that picture. So um, I, I went to a, a bunch of Aboriginal reserves to I was fascinated by the Aboriginal culture and, and people, and so this man, his, his name was Bill Nigy, and he, if you have seen the Crocodile Dundee films, he, that was his land, the Kakadu Rain, uh, area, rainforest area, and so and he spoke very poetically, in fact, there, there are books of his that are considered poems, and he had this deep, uh, new Marvin voice, and uh, so anyway, I, I, he was uh, one of my favorite subjects to paint. Was it, was it hard to get access to these people? Access not, not in the sense that you go see them, but to access that the, they're comfortable, they're willing to pose for you. Always, Were they open? Always willing, always warm. <laughs> the, the, the difficulty was traveling from like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles yeah. in the outback, you know, um, to get to get to different reserves because Australia is quite large. Well, so maybe they appreciate you making the effort. You know? Just, just, um... Nice people? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, so let's see. And now, first of all, before you flip that picture, uh -huh. that reminds me of an Andrew Wyeth. Really? Am, I, am I crazy, or does that have an Andrew Wyeth vibe to it? A little bit? Uh, all right, okay, stop dropping the pins. All right. Oh, this is nice. So one of the most dramatic things that I experienced in the Outback was um, so I'm with my boyfriend that I met at Time Magazine in New York, right. and we're in this you know truck uh, and camping out as we go. But um, we went, and the Aboriginal people do these bushfires. It's a way of clearing the area so that the new shoots will come up and then they can hunt better, they can see what's going on. So but we drove right, and there's a bushfire here, and there's one there, and I just like, oh, we've got to stop. This is so, the most dramatic thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. And so I incorporated that into a, um, a painting of these very stoic um, Aboriginal women right. that I met in, in a corroboree. Right. Uh, out of curiosity, how are you on art supplies when you're in the middle of nowhere? How do you handle that? 
Well, we brought, um, actually, we brought different supplies. I brought some, stupidly, some pastels, mm -hmm. because we were bouncing in these trucks all, and <laughs> it just turned, it all turned to powder, yeah. just complete powder. But, um, but you have water colors, did you have oils as well, or? Um, a, not a lot. Yeah, it yeah, that's a lot. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, but. All right, let's keep going, let's see another Oh, look at that picture, wow. <laughs> Now, before we get into the, what's going on with this picture, I'm curious about how your style is sort of developing here. It has a certain style to it, right? Well, I think this was probably, the style was influenced by doing work for The New Yorker, yeah. because I did, I would do kind of like these model prints and then paint into them, as it was a quick way of working um, that I could ship off, you know, but, yeah. but it still had a painterly feel to it. So, um, so this painting you're saying, you laid down a tone first, uh, a mono print tone, which gave you some sort of abstract tone, mm -hmm. and then on top of it, you bring the lights mm -hmm. and, and the, the uh, figures emerge. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I love yeah. it. I love it. And it's, well, is that the same? No, it's not the same person. That, what, what's no, going on this, picture? this is so. <laughs> there was an Australian journalist who I really liked named Cameron Forbes. I liked his writing, and I um, I went and met him, and I said. Um, I'd love to do a job, you know, with you. Do the, instead of using photographs, how about using illustrations or paintings? And so he's, well, I'm going to Papua New Guinea. Do you want to come? So, so we went. And so this story has to do with, uh, oh, well, and so we went. And um, and there was also a, a a writer named Bob Connolly and his wife who were film. They were writing a book about Papua New Guinea, and I heard him on the radio before I went. And I said, I really want to meet that guy. So we, he's the one that I met up in Papua, yeah, up in our hotel in, in Mount Hagen, and um, because his house had been burned down, uh, and because he had helped somebody in one of these spear throwing things. So anyway, he and his wife took <laughs> us into a, a battle, basically. All right, so let me rewind the tape here. So you go to Papua New Guinea, and there's yeah. a lot of violence between tribes? Is that there are, right? yeah. Right, so, so there's, danger, yes. there's danger. And of course you go there, of yeah. course, you know, like from the sharks to the to yeah. this. And and what's happened here is the fella, this Bob Connell fellow, is a writer, say that? He is, yeah, a filmmaker, actually. He and his wife are a team. It turns out, from what you told me the other day, Bob Connell helped one of these uh, tribal people who had been speared. He took him to the, made the mistake of taking him to the hospital. So and so the other tribe burned his house down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> but I got to meet him though. It was convenient for me. Now, when you made this picture, was it going to go anywhere? Or was it, this it going was, to where? It was for the New Age, um, which is a man, uh, News, the main man, uh, newspaper in Melbourne. Okay. okay. Yeah. And that's where Cameron, Cameron worked for the oh. newspaper. So we did this together, basically. So All right, well, let's, let's move to the next one. Right. Let's see. Here we go. Oh, look at that. Okay. That's nice. So while we were there, we met um, Pius Wing Ti. He was the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, and his mother, and um, who. Uh, no. Anyway. And they stood there just like that in the sketch? For hours. No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No. <laughs> so what happened to this picture? Where is this picture? He has now? it. He, he, has, he it. has it. Yes. That's um, wonderful. Yeah. I don't know. It was a lovely thing. And he, the thing about Pius Green Tea was he was the first prime minister to come from kind of like this almost, they, de they described it as caveman, like beginnings, because he was from the highlands. Where all this warfare yeah. is going on. Yeah. And um, anyway, and so he was, became prime minister, and then he became prime minister in in Papua New Guinea, Australia. You, I think so you can only run for like six years, have what term? Six years. Right. And then you have to step down. But he came back. You have to. There's a waiting period. I see. So wow. he became prime minister again. Uh, a picture like this, and when you're working in a field like this, do you limit the size that you're working? What size do you normally work at? Um, it was, yeah, it was small. It was not too small. Okay. Uh, and what is the medium? Do you remember? That was monoprint, too. Um, like, because I just did a, like, a rough background and then I worked into it with, you know, a uh, pencil or whatever. Beautiful. I love it. Okay, let's yeah. see another one. So they're standing in front of where his umbilical cord was buried or something. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh. 
Oh, okay. So it's going to be that kind of interview. Okay. <laughs> All right, so this is an interesting story. Now we're shifting gears. I remember yes. this picture. So okay. we're no longer in Australia. Why don't we go to where? Chiapas, Mexico. Of course. And this is the, I just get a kick out of this story because when, when I was asking you questions the other day, mm -hmm. how you ended up there, it's funny. I will let you explain and then I will point out what I think is funny. Go ahead. Okay. So but, uh, why are we here? I just had had a, a big exhibition in, in Manhattan on um, um, my Australian work. And then I felt like, now what? Now what do I, there's like this huge, anti-climax after you have a show. Like, what do I now what do I do with my life? And I picked up a, um, a Time magazine, and there was this little blurb about this woman, Gertrude Bloom, a Swiss photojournalist, who um, lived in Chiapas, Mexico, and she was the advocate for the indigenous Lacandon people okay. there, who, and they're a very special Mayan people because they um, they were kind of the closest link to the Mayans. They had not been indoctrinated by the Spaniards because there were too few of them. They lived in the rainforest, and so there. So we we looked to them for knowledge about the Mayan culture. And she, but in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, the you know, Mexican government started to come in and cut down their rainforest. Right. And so um, Gertrude Bloom became a real advocate. She and her husband for um, the Lacando people, and so... And that's her on the left, right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So I read this little blurb about her in time, she was called the Queen of the Jungle, and I've got to meet this one. Of course. <laughs> so, so you sent her a letter, right? I did, but I didn't wait for a reply. I just, I went down... So this is a funny thing. You A normal person... <laughs> but a normal person would be like, I've sent a letter, a month, I'll we'll get something back. Maybe I'll go, maybe I'll, you know, go move out around. I don't know. And you say, now I'm going to go find the queen of the jungle. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's the best. She was intrigued. And, and, you, and then what, you show up on her doorstep, knock, knock? Well, because she and her husband had started this institute called Navarone, which means the house of the jaguar, which was a play on her last, their last name, Bloom. Right. And um, it was an institute that actually it sort of provides sanctuary for the Lacandon people. And, and they, you know, the scientists come from Harvard and Yale, and um, they have a library there, they have a museum, okay. but they also have a little hotel. And then, and Trudy Bloom was there. She was like, you know, all in her jewelry and finery, and right. she appears every night at that table. And so I, I, I wanted to do her portrait, so I went down there with, that was well, what How did she receive you? Was she welcoming? Yes, yes, she was. Oh, nice. her, so, and, um, but even though I, I had heard stories that she was didn't, didn't like, like my boyfriend, <laughs> <laughs> who was about 50 years younger than she was. Like, um, anyway. Okay, so what's the plan now that you're down there? What, what's your next So plan? then I, I, um, I, my plan was to do her portrait, but then she introduced me to the Lacandon people, and I just became so intrigued by them because they were like the closest link to the ancient Maya. Yeah. And so I met um, a, a guide who's also become a really close friend named Barry Norris, who was a photographer. And it, actually, she was a photojournalist, so he was. Um, developing all of her prints, right. which was kind of too old at the time, but he also worked as a guide, and he took me down into the Lacandon jungle, which is about a six-hour, seven-hour drive, okay. or maybe more, and um, oh. to introduce me to the Lacandon people. Let's see what you have. Let's see what you've done with that. Okay. Now, so who this, is this? This is Chunking Viejo, was his name, and he was uh, the elder of, it, of the Lacandon people and kept with his kind of animistic beliefs and uh, he was reputed to be like in his a hundred or so and he was just um, very gracious and welcomed me into his family right. and to be like a documentary it, it, this, and I attribute this to the School of Visual Arts just seeking out your own project right. and kind of as an artist journalist and, um, I like but him he, very much. yeah, really and um, he. So I would, I would sketch him, and he'd be in his hammock, and his, the kids would be behind me, like giggling, and and the woman didn't speak Spanish, and um, but and I knew that he was blind, um, 
an arthritic, he always had a cigar in his hand and, um, and, and with a dog at his feet. And, and um, so I was sketching him and the kids were giggling and, and I think he felt bad. So he said, let me see, let me see, you know, with his blind eyes. So I showed him and he was, oh, muy bonito. <laughs> so, and, you know, so he was just very uh, loving. Let's see some more, it's beautiful. This was one of his wives. He had three wives. He outlived the first one, but um, did you say he lived to about 110? 110. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, and so this is one of his wives. Yeah. She's shucking corn, which you know, they, 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 that's what my woman does. You know, they eat tortillas three times a day. So. And they were, and she was quite comfortable with you uh, sketching away while mm -hmm. she did her work. Yeah. 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 That's nice. Yeah. And when you're making these pictures. Um, you don't have a project in mind, you're just making them. You're an artist. I was there kind of as a documentary because I knew that they were a disappearing culture. Yeah. The life of people, they were changing. I mean, they couldn't help it. The rainforest, yeah. the rainforest people, and it was being encroached upon. And, uh, and I mean, so this is in the 1990s, and it, it really has changed considerably. Yeah. I mean, she's wearing the traditional dress with the skirt and um, the beads, and um, the young people are not doing that so much anymore. No. I'm not worried. I'm so. Let's see some. Okay. And then I wanted to document kind of their uh, artifacts. These are god pots that they would, um, you know, fill copal incense and burn and right. to, uh, worship the gods. And, it was beautiful. And, and they had god houses, and I was not allowed because I was a, a woman, you know, more impure. That's why. I mean. Mm -hmm. I had to sit on the edge, but they would bring me um, this fermented drink that they made kind of like a beer out of honey from the stingless bees called balche. Wow. And uh, so I would drink it, and they, they drink a lot of it to connect with the gods, you know, come to get so drunk that they think that's what it's <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know. so some of those are the incense. Okay. And then um, Chunking Viejo, they all have an animal spirit, and his was the uh, spider monkey. So, and it's called Maash. Maash. So, uh, anyway, yeah, it's a painting so that. There it is, yeah. That's good. Mm -hmm. What's the story with this one? Well, it's called Carmel Points, and it has to do uh, the Mayans. When the Spaniards came and they saw that the Mayans had these blue crosses, they thought, oh, our job is done, they're already Christianized. But to, for, the, for the Mayan, it has a different meaning. It has to do with the tree of life, and it's always a turquoise blue. And actually, um, the Mayan, in, they don't have a different word for blue and green. It's uh -huh. always, a, it's called yash. Um, I, I don't know why they don't differentiate, but anyway, so it's always that turquoise. Yeah. And then it has to do with the cardinal points of where the, the rains come from, where the sun comes up, and the rains come from the north, and then the, the sun goes back into the underworld, and, and then there's the rebirth of the yellow. So the colors are kind of... I see. That's, it's more of a symbolic painting. Oh, ah, okay. But, that's a beautiful painting. Thank you. Yeah. That's, oh, okay. Now where are we here? Well, this, uh, so I, when I went down there, I would bring art supplies and the kids would surround me. And the kids were the ones that really broke the ice for me yeah. because they spoke both Spanish and Mayan. And, um, and uh, they followed me around, so I'd bring extra supplies for them and start so it, drawing and painting. And I was just blown away at how prolific they were and how that it's just all of them were so talented. So what? each time I came down, I'd bring extra supplies. Mm -hmm. And then this evolved into something of the, um, these workshops that I started doing. And then I co coerced a English artist to come down and, and give workshops to the Lacandon people. But these girls, they're different villages. And where Chanking Viejo was from, um, they wore the traditional clothes and they kept with the animistic beliefs. Um, Protestant missionaries got to another village this in Lacanha, and so they're wearing kind of a modern clothes mm -hmm. and pattern. But um, but we did workshop art workshops. I, I brought like eight artists down, and we did art workshops. One time that we were down, the first time I got them all, I got funding for it and everything. And, and um, I don't know if you remember uh, the Zapatista Revolution in Mexico. Well, it happened, it started like the day we arrived. So <laughs> we had to abandon all of our supplies. And, and, and being the foolish person that I was, I was like, 
oh, let's go hide out in Palenque. This is great. But I had some more sensible, a couple of hours like, no, we're getting the hell out of here. <laughs> You're getting us out of here. So anyway, okay. so unfortunately, I didn't get to hide out and uh, see the Zephyr. Oh, what a shame. Well, the pictures yeah, but, we, but we did come back, and, you know, like a year later right. and do workshops. So. Yeah. And, uh, and then, so, um, so I never did Trudy's, Gertrude Bloom's portrait, because um, I got so wrapped up with the Lakado people. But, um, and then she died, like, in the 1990s, mid-1990s. And, um, but recently, Navalong, her home, which is uh, now a cultural study institute, asked me to do this mural of her and Chanking Viejo. So um, I've been working on that. Uh, actually, and I, I became um, friends with the director of the Lower Side Girls Club, and so she sponsored sending me down there to to work on the mural. And I, I need to get back down there. How much more do you have to do? Just you know, probably twenty years worth. Oh. <laughs> I, I want an excuse to keep going. I see. No, um, I got we it. did quite a bit, but um, and we've had other people kind of help with you know, fringe, like, you know, floral things and stuff, but mm -hmm. I want to do a spider monkey, that's my next So that was the beginning. That's Trudy. nice. So that's, and they were both really close friends, uh, Trudy Bloom and Chuck Hibia, he called her, I think, he called her the moon, and she called him the little sun because actually his name, Chang King Viejo, means little prophet of the sun oh. in, in Mayans. Mm -hmm. oh, there's the guy house behind him where we drank all that vulture. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so that gets us up. Is this, where is this now? This is a... Uh, I started, uh, Colleen is probably more familiar with some of this work because I did, um, I love marketplaces because it's an ancient, uh, tradition in, in, in Latin America. If you ever go to the Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City, there's this huge uh, model of, of a, a marketplace. All these little figurines play very realistic. Like, and so, and this continues throughout Mexico, the marketplace. I love it because of the colors, because of the, uh, you know, the, the activity in this ancient tradition. It reminds so, me of going out. Your cocktail yeah, series. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's very similar. And all the you know, the painted uh, walls and so on. Yeah. So that's what that's about. Mm -hmm. oh, no, oh look at that one. And so she's a woman from a marketplace. You know, inside they have interiors you can go in to. That's a great painting. And those are two very traditional drinks that you would get in Mexico, the orchata from the Rice drink and then the hibiscus drink. Um, uh, tea like drink. You, you probably had to use a, a photo, right, to get this uh, mm -hmm. shot to work it up. Because yes, this is like an oil painting, right? It is, yeah. yeah. I took a lot of. I, I, I'm and did you, do you ask them? Can I take your picture? Of picture? course, yeah. You do, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but okay. I take a lot of photos because I'm not a great photographer, and I'll take bits and pieces and yeah. kind of put it together. Put it together. You're, you're familiar with that. I am. Yeah, yeah. 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 And oh, then, look at that. This is another monotype, but it, I put it in because it's from my grandmother's hometown in Los Mochis, front in another marketplace. Kind of like they have these little diners, you know, that you just. Uh, you have to educate me. So this is a monoprint, or mm -hmm. monotype, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, and it's not oil painted, it's an ink, right? It is oil, though, but it's an etching, like an etching ink. And, and to me, the colors are so strong. I love that. That's what, yeah, I like about them, too, the inks. And they're like saltwater taffy when you mix them. They're really sticky yeah. and gooey. You have to kind of... Very you know. nice. Okay, let's take some. Oh, and so this, let's talk right. about this one. Okay. This is a killer painting. Thank you. What's going on in this painting? Where is it? Where did the idea come from? And and uh, tell me about it. So um, this painting uh, has to do with Mexico, and my grandmother and great grandmother are from Mazatlan, which means the the area the area of the deer. So and in that area. They have a, this dance that they do where they put the deer head on and they put little uh, cocoons on that shake on their ankles. So that's kind of the deer. The, it's a play on you know the deer that history and. Um, that's a pretty yeah. personal painting, though. It is. I yeah. mean, that, that, that the land where your mom is from. Yeah. And then there's a lot of symbolism going on in here. And then you also did something that I love that I never do, but you you pasted in 
elements into the collage in right. elements into the picture. So it's so multi layer. What are some of the symbols in here that you can talk about? Well, the, my great grandmother's, um, her, her, it's not her passport, it's, but she was coming to see my grandmother. So that's her, like her visa or something to come into okay. the United States. And, um, and I didn't, don't know that much about my, you know, my great great grandmother. And when I would ask my grandmother, so what kind of Indian blood do we have? She was still come from the old school where she didn't want to be recognized as an Indian. Yeah. She, she wasn't like from Frida Kahlo, Diego Rivera's camp. She, she wanted to think that she was all Spanish, and, and, yeah. um, and she actually had some Irish in her too. Right. She said, we don't have. But her her people came from Mazatlan area, and that area is a Nahuatl speaking um, area. So, right. um, I, I forgot what you asked me. Uh, well, no, I was asking about some of the symbolism. The big so, was a heart with the arrows in it that caught my eye. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a flag, obviously. There's a little girl in the back. And the woman behind it is because I don't really know that much about my ancestors from Mazatlan, but yeah. they're, they're from that area, Nahuatl speaking area. And does this picture and some of the other pictures you've been doing lately tie into any of what's going on? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. So, what yes. explain that? How does that tie in? Um, well, so if you follow this painting around, it, to me it kind of begins from the bottom left and it kind of moves around to my mother is over there in her first communion dress. She's about eight years old. She came to the United States when she was five. And, um, and when we lived in upstate New York, she just moved recently from her, my father passed away about two years ago and she's moved from the ranch to Tucson. And so I went through a lot of their old files, and she had all these old recipes from when we lived in upstate New York uh, on exotic Mexican food. Because when we lived in upstate New York, we had to depend on my aunts and my grandmother to come and bring us tortillas and beans right. and chilies and things like that. To, so, uh, so I found all these old recipes, and I kind of and collaged them into this painting. I want to ask you a quick side note. Uh, when your mother who was Mexican, married your father. Mm -hmm. Is the story correct that she lost her citizenship? That was my your grand grandmother. Tell me about it. So my um, grandmother, she met this wild Irishman who came down to Mexico. Uh, he had a mechanic business, which was like having, you know, Microsoft or something in, in, in Mexico at the time, it was the 1920s. So because back then it was a chauvinistic society, she, um, if a, if a woman married, a Mexican woman married a foreigner, they, she lost her citizenship. If she was a Mexican man marrying a foreigner, they both would have gained Mexican citizenship. But she lost her citizenship marrying this gringo, it's a crazy Ital um, not right. Italian, Irish man. Um, but then, then what happened? And they came to the States. Many years later, and, and my grandfather had this lucrative business as a mechanic, and then he um, got the gold fever and sold everything and then lost everything <laughs> um. looking for gold in Mexico. So um, he came, they had to come, you know, with a tail between the legs to the United States. And when she came to the United States, she was denied U.S. citizenship. All her kids, she had, by that time she had six kids. My, they, mother, my mother being one of them. And they had U.S. citizenship, but she did They not. were granted, but my grandmother was not. So she had no and, citizenship. And then, and she was she was very well educated too, and she had to do with a lot of prejudice in Arizona. Is where they ended up. And like for one instance, she opened her door one day, and somebody had painted Mexican pig on the front door. Yeah. So, um, and this was a well educated woman. But um, so let's see another one. Okay. We're, we're, we're sort of coming to the end of the line. So that's about her. That's actually her story. This is her story. Here. Yeah, okay. because. She, because they lost everything, she had to put everything in this one trunk, and, and she put in her, her bridal gown and um, some, I don't know what else. Yeah. So, oh, that's beautiful. And that's her, she cut her hair like a flapper, which her, her mother cried and cried and cried when she did that. <laughs> 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 Very that's nice. Grandfather. And then there's this picture. Uh -huh. Wow, this is some picture. So this is... Uh, what is the bus signal? What's going on with the school bus? It actually... 
It started with a dream that I had. This is probably the most out there painting that I've done, but it started with a dream uh, of me trying to get on a bus and being excluded and feeling excluded. Yeah. And that would be for whatever reason. And I think so. Um, some of the figures in it, it you know, the, um, the Virgin of Guadalupe is a, um, you know, she's the, the oh, she's saint of, of Mexico. Yeah. And what's special about her is that she is dark skinned, so she's indigenous. And um, she was, yeah, right. And there's always roses around her. And so this is another big painting. Yeah, yeah. And how long did this take to make? I'm just curious. It's I so started fun. it and then worked on other things and started it. And, um, and, and then the mountains in the background are actually from what I would see from my parents' property in Arizona. Right. It's called the Chiricahua Mountains, huh? where Cochise actually is buried in some secret place. And, and of course, behind the bus is a wall. Mm -hmm. And that ties into what's yes. going on now. Yes, and all the the crosses are for, like all the people that have died coming up, trying to cross the desert for a better life, basically. Right. And uh, the women in the my daughter is a model for all the, all the <laughs> symbolic people, but the one up on top is called La Llorona. She's a very um, a lot of kids in Mexico dress up as her for yeah. Halloween. She's she's the woman that cries the, for the loss of her children. Well, oh. anyhow, I mean I could. It's a complicated painting. Uh, yeah, it's, it's quite amazing. All right, that, is, that, is there anything else? Uh, hey, remember when I said she has patience, she'll paint type where I would never dare go. Look at all that type that's around the border. That's all handmade. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, I agree for this one. It did take a lot of patience. I tried to pawn it off on my daughter. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but she, her name is Irma, and uh, she. Um, a good name. You, uh, well, thank you. But she, uh, she has actually some of our friends here know Irma. But she was thrown into jail because she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Even though you know she came across the, the border and um, recently uh, she was thrown in jail. Recently, big, yeah. So she spent six months in detention in New Jersey and had to go through her savings. Um, to get representation, to get out, uh, that she had been, she and her husband had saved for like uh, 14 years for her daughter's college education right. to get out. But um, so she's going through all the legal channels to become a citizen. But um, well, she got caught in the net. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. Okay. And that's why it says that they do not cross all around. Right. Okay. Uh, that's okay. strong. Thank you. Right, that used to be like a Lower East Side Girls Club. Okay. Um, anyway, my favorite Mexican president, Benito Juarez. I actually saw the show um, at the Long Island Museum um, that had George Washington with the American Eagle. Um, oh, um, which show was that? The Larry Rivers show? Larry Rivers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this was kind of my response to that, that Benito Juarez, who was. The only, I think, the only uh, full indigenous president of Mexico, and um, he was raised, but he was orphaned and raised by priests in Oaxaca. He became a lawyer. He went on to become um, governor of Oaxaca and then president. And he was uh, in correspondence with Abraham Lincoln. They were kind of friends. Yeah, yeah. yeah and he chased the French out of Mexico. He's a hero of, of Mexico, basically. So this was kind of my. You know, version of the Larry Rivers. You know. would, would you say that your multi layered style, uh, multi images in, in one picture, is that influenced by Mexican art? Is that, is that in tradition with. I don't know. <laughs> okay, all right. Maybe. Maybe. It, seems, I think it's, it seems familiar. I think it's trying to tell a lot of stories in one image. Okay. And 16 is an important number. Uh, I'm kind of borrowing from the lottery cards in Mexico because he actually made those official, they're simple little, I don't know if you've seen them, the leather cards, there's always a number, there's a name, and there's an image. And he officiated those to help people in Mexico become literate. But the numbers always have some kind of meaning. So 16 is for the, the lottery card for the flag, the uh, Mexican flag, because the 16th of um. September is their day of 
liberation. Yeah, yeah. So anyway. All right. Let's see. Yeah, another one. And we are sort of getting down yeah. to the line here, so we should get through that. Back. Okay. Uh, this is a great picture. I love that. Well, I'm fascinated by the uh, luchadors, they're called the, the wrestlers in Mexico. It's like a whole scene. Yeah. But also that name, luchar, means to struggle. To, so there's kind of like a double entendre there. Yeah. Um, and, and what are on this, these surfaces that you're painting on? That looks like a map? Yeah. Okay. And this, so in Arizona, there was actually a big mural of El Jefe. He was a jaguar that was crossing the border, going back and forth. Mm -hmm. And he became this kind of famous jaguar. I think he's probably since died, but now there's a new one called Elvis. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so they're breaking the rules by going back and forth. Kind of. <laughs> It means the chief. So in other words, you didn't sit in front of the shower and no. say, do you mind if I sketch you? Okay. So I, I just kind of did kind of my version of these little lottery cards. Yeah, you know, right. That's my daughter who I used. <laughs> but, you know what I'm going to throw in a quick little aside? Um, Kellen has, uh, you've swam across the sound. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What does that have to do with art? Well, I just say that <laughs> I see the tail. I thought I should just throw that. Right. No, I know. She's so fast as a mermaid. Runs in the family. That's right. Uh, but I love that there's women wrestlers. Like, I kind of collaged a couple of the women wrestlers. <laughs> That's nice. Really nice. <laughs> and these are all fairly small, or are they? Those are small, those little ones. These are it's small. Um, the monarch, because it has it symbolizes migration. Yeah. 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 Then, of course, the dog. Now we come back full circle. <laughs> then I did this for the dog show um, last year. This this year I did a different piece, but that's in in Manhattan right now. If any of you get there, go see it. It's fun. Is it near? Uh, do you guys notice that there's a certain palette, a certain color? to her work. I, I mean, maybe not so much the ones that we just saw in Mexico, but the Coney Island ones, the Marketplace ones, this, this sort of, what was the word for blue and green? Yash. Yash, there's a yashness to it. <laughs> I like. It's my favorite color. It is. Nice. Yeah. 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 All right, let's see about it. Oh, so, so they're the wrestlers again, and this is the, um, you know, the, Juan Crow is kind of like the, the term for Jim, you know, Jim Crow, the Juan Crow is for the Mexican people. Mm -hmm. so he's breaking through different barriers. I see, nice. And also, I'm sorry, I collaged in the little crows that were in Disney because they were, you know, the two Mexican crows. <laughs> ah, Kevin, does work mean a uh, 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 crow? Uh, <laughs> Quite a both crow. Cuervo. Mm -hmm. Jose Cuervo. That's right. Ah, I didn't know that. I'm not that just, wow. I'm not, I'm not sh I think I ended with this piece. Yes. This is uh, Fuster. He's, um, so I've, I've been to Peru, uh, Peru, uh, Cuba four times, and um, I've become friends with this particular man, and he's, he's like the Gaudi of, of Cuba. Mm -hmm. He does um, these amazing mosaics. And um, so Fuster. And, I, and actually, I'm going to be in a show there, and, which I'm really excited about. It's not easy <laughs> being in a show in Cuba um, the, in April. The Cuban Biennial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I was, was going to have one little piece, coming. which I haven't even started, and I have to have it done. What are you going to put in there? I'm not sure, because I haven't started it, but a print. Oh, it has okay. to be a print. It's oh, a print right. for a print show. Yeah. Will, you, will you actually go to Cuba and, and be part of the show? I was just in Cuba, and oh. I think I did. I would love to be there in April, but I have a little too much time. Yeah, thank you. Oh, of course. Okay. Yeah. So uh, that's the last image. Are there any questions? <laughs>